Hi, Vanessa. Thank you for joining us for this conversation for British Vogue. And congratulations on your Oscar and BAFTA nominations for Pieces of a Woman. If you could explain about the film and your role as Martha. So the movie is about a woman and a couple who, who lose a baby and then basically for the, for the next seven months navigates the, the journey of really getting through every day. In, in many different scenarios, from the everyday to the most difficult moment of those sort of dates that are mapped out. Yeah. Um, and the director always said it's like an odyssey of, of her grief, really. And, and and I always sort of understood it like that in a way, because it's like choppy waters and then it gets calm. Yeah. And then it's completely still. Your portrayal is, is, as, is as authentic as I hoped it would be. And I remember watching the film and thinking, please don't mess this up. Like, please, for me, and everyone else it's happened to, please don't mess this up. And none of you did. It's beautiful. And, and I, watched it a, I watched it a few times. And um, each time different things come to me and it gets easier. With this, you must have been inundated with people who have messaged you about baby loss and their own experiences. And do you follow like a weight of responsibility? As someone who's not experienced it, but has played it so accurately. I feel so grateful to be included in the um, conversation about it. And I I guess because of people like you and, and you know, women that I'm so close to now that I spent time with before doing it, because I knew, I, I knew, I'm not a mother, I would mm. love to be. I knew that my biggest responsibility was to try and somehow um, d distill everybody's sort of collective experience of which mm. there is so much commonality with it into this one, a particular natured character, because mm. she's very, very different to me, um, which was its own sort of challenge. But um, to try and m make that that experience true somehow in a, in, a, how, in a person throughout. How long did you take to research this before? Like, you know, mm. how many months did you spend? Because I know you were also on a labor ward. Yes. Where the births, you actually watched someone giving birth yeah. to play this properly. Amazing. Jesus, what a gift. Like, oh my God. It was just, it, that was a miracle. That was a miracle because I'd been on the labour ward for many days with the midwives. Because because that was the thing, you know, there wasn't, firstly, I, so there's three things I knew I had to research, like really in depth, because um, I've never been pregnant. So I knew I had to understand what being pregnant was mm. and, the, and the lead up to giving birth and the things that must go on in your mind and the hopes that you have and the sort of things you try and ignore and you plan and whatever all of that, and then labor itself, which I knew nothing about, and then obviously what it's like to lose a baby, and those three things were like totally separate. Yeah. So um, the, the first one was the, was the easiest in the sense of how the, you know, I spoke to everyone I knew, I yeah. like mainly just got it from like people's genuine experience of it, and whenever I saw anyone pregnant on the train, I'd be like, oh, wow, like really study it. So, I'm so I feel so close to anyone that's pregnant now. The, then the labor, I felt so scared to get that bit wrong, because if I did, people would, no, straight away. You know, it was yeah. also one take. Yeah, but also, this is the crazy thing. When I found out, when I'd watched the film, that this scene was one take. Like, you... One take for the whole thing. How many times did you do it? We did it six. We did it four the first day, two, yeah. two the second. Um, and so I think the, the shot that they... The take, they used the fourth take of the first day, which is, which is like 24 minutes. So watching that, again, I was just like... This is what happens. Like, oh, the dread when I first watched the film, because you, you know what's coming. And you're just like, you're getting through it, you know, and I was watching you in labor and just even watching the film, knowing what's happened, I'm like, please be okay. Please let that baby be okay, you know, and you know what's coming. And because you did it so authentically, I wasn't as disturbed by it, if that makes sense. Like, if you'd have got it wrong, I would have been perhaps cross or like that didn't happen and oh another film that's mm. going the wrong way with this I know you've been so open about it and and about the night Axel left you and I just wondered um if you I know that you wanted to mm. share it I remember feeling slightly unwell and I called my doctor and I said to my doctor I I'm a five months pregnant woman and I said, I don't feel right. Something isn't right. And she said, we'll get you a scan tomorrow and just take it easy and go to bed. And now the, the one thing I would say is that if you have any inkling that something isn't right and you're a pregnant woman, you just go straight to the hospital. 
Like, this is my only regret and something that I don't want to be angry at myself about. But I will be angry at myself about it for some time until I can process it properly. But I should have gone to A&E. So I go to bed not feeling quite right. And I wake up at, at about three in the morning. And my baby's moved down. So he's more here. And he's not supposed to be there. And I woke my husband up and I said, something's not right. We're going to have to go to hospital, like now. And my son is sleeping. He was five and a half at the time. And I said, something's not right. So I get up and I've got what I think are period pains because at this point you don't connect that it's a contraction. So I walked through to the bathroom downstairs and I said to my husband, I'm just going to go to the loo. And then I walked into the bathroom and at this point, my waters broke. But not only that, my son's legs came out. So I could feel that there was a baby in between my legs. So I looked down and his, his legs were there. And my husband obviously is terrified. Um, so he dials 999 and actually a beautiful, wonderful human being answered the phone that night. And she was so good to us and she was so calm. And she said, you're going to have to deliver your baby on the floor, you know, put some towels down and you're going to have to, you know, so we put her on speakerphone in the bathroom. And I remember her saying, OK, crouch down and you're going to have to deliver your baby. And then she asked, is he alive? And we could see him breathing. And I said, yes, he's alive. And so she said, right, you're going to have to give him mouth to mouth. So my husband starts giving this, you know, he's this big, you know, he's not people. I think people also don't imagine how how they look babies at this point. But they're, they're a baby. I mean, he, he's a baby. Um, and then we could hear my son. And there's, I mean, there's blood everywhere. And there's a baby. And there's panic. And, and I remember being quite calm at this point. And I went into real, you know, survival mode of how do I fix this? And then my son, and then we could hear the ambulance outside. And this is the point about when Sean in the film runs out to the ambulance. This point kills me when I watch the film because this is what happened to us when the ambulance arrived. And it was then that I, then I, it's weird to say this, it was then that I knew how serious it was. And these two guys come in. There was a young ambulance guy, an Australian, who was, who was clearly terrified and that didn't help me. And this other guy who was super in control. And he said to me, we can't save him. We can't save him. And so I hope no one finds him because they'll get in trouble for this. But I said, can, can he die with me, please? Can I be with him when he dies on my own? So they, he said yes. I'm sure he wasn't supposed to say yes. But he said yes. So Axel died with me. And then I opened the door. It was like literally seconds. I opened the door and he said, can you, can you go to the ambulance? Can you walk to the ambulance? So we picked... We picked me and obviously Axel still with me at this point on the umbilical cord. And I remember it was three in the morning. I was like, thank God none of the neighbors can see this. And I went to, to the ambulance. And I remember this. And then, and then we leave. And then we leave for the hospital. And my baby's on my tummy. And at this point, I'm like, I'm, I'm carrying a dead baby. My, my baby's dead. And he's, I'm, I'm holding my baby and he's, you know, and he's dead. And then we go to hospital and there's a doctor comes over and he doesn't, he doesn't address me, which really, really upset me. He didn't address me. He addressed the nurse. I, I'm assuming it's a nurse next to me at this point. And then my son arrived and I just said to him, you know, your brother died. Your brother died. And um, I lost part of my memory from that time. I can't tell you what happened. I, I can't remember Axel being taken from me. You know, he, um, you know, I can't remember. I, um, there's two hours where he was taken and then he was brought back into the room. I don't know what happened. You know, my mind was so overwhelmed with grief that you just, you cannot, it's blacked it out, you know? So crazy. Hmm. The one question I did want to ask you was about forgiveness, mm -hmm. self-forgiveness. You know, because I, I know from, from Martha's perspective, the, I was really trying to get into the idea that I think 
for a long time she blamed herself in some ways yeah. and I just wondered about that journey because Martha's journey throughout it is very jaggedy and mm -hmm. you know and, and comes to finding her own voice of her own truth about how to find a way to live alongside it with, yeah. with, a, with a serenity and a peace and a love that her baby has brought her and I just yeah. wondered about that that and your journey it, towards that. It certainly took a while um, because every time I would talk about my baby the immediate thought that would come to mind was you didn't go to hospital and you knew you weren't feeling mm. great. I wasn't ill but I, I, I intuitively knew something was up. But because I called my doctor and she said, you'll go to, you know, go to hospital tomorrow, it's fine. This is why I said, okay, fine. No, 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 I should have just listened to myself and just gone to hospital. So every time someone was kind to me, but you didn't go to hospital, every time someone would send flowers, but it's on me, you didn't go to hospital, this is your fault, you know? And it took a long time and I did a lot of my own research on pregnancy loss and causes and, and you know, to know that it wasn't, it wasn't my fault. And because I'd worked out that day, albeit gently, it, that wasn't my fault. And because I'd had, I don't know, didn't sleep very well for a week, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my fault, but you'll find every reason imaginable to put the, the death blame on yourself. Why do you think that is? Because, because it's your body? Because, you, yeah, because you're supposed to protect your baby, mm. right? You, you know, you are the mother, you're supposed to protect this baby at all costs. And for a, for a while, not for a long time, but for a while, you know, I, I caused the death of my baby. I, my body couldn't cope. I, when in truth, my cervix was damaged from my first son. And if I'd have had more regular scans, which I didn't even think about, they would have seen that my cervix was opening because if it was weak. And this is why as Axel got heavier, my cervix was doing this until he couldn't stay up inside of me and he, he was birthed because he, my cervix gave way. Um, but all these things, I should have had more scans, but most women don't, right? I should have gone to hospital when I felt something was a bit odd. Most po people probably wouldn't go to hospital, you know? So you have to find just a way to really work with what's happened and just, and just find that forgiveness and that peace and now, I can't say it's a beautiful experience. I can say what's come from it. Now I'm really past the grief and despair and everything else that came with it. That I, lit I smile about him when I think about him rather than get that pang of pain. I don't anymore. I just smile about him and I still cry about him. And I wish he was here and there's a, a, a lady in the neighborhood and we were very, very equal on our pregnancies. And I see her son with her sometimes walking along the street. And I always think, that, wow, you know, Axel would be this size. And it's, it's hard to see her, but equally it's, it's, it's okay, you know. When someone dies that, I don't know, might be 80, right? They've met so many people. Yeah. They did it. It's still the same grieving process because you're, you're losing someone you're missing. Yeah. And yet when someone dies when they're sort of 80, everyone says their name and they talk about them. And there's yeah. a big funeral and there's a big... So I think that's part of the aloneness. Is mm. that, so in a way... Losing someone that, you know, talking to someone that's lost someone that maybe you knew and you say, oh, how's, how are you feeling? We loved him. And how's your, you know. Yeah. But there's, if you apply the same thing and you say, how's your baby? Yes. Or oh, Axel, you know. Yes, so can that you talk about him? Like, how do you, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that so you feel less kind of shut off yeah. from the, the world and everything. I mean, I know from my experience of losing people, the the one thing that's helped is, is um feeling like there's a community around me that yeah. knew the person that can talk to me about it that I can share with, that I can ring up when I really miss them. Sands, the brilliant, brilliant baby baby loss charity, that one of their slogans is break the silence. Mm -hmm. And the other slogan of Sands is you're not alone, which means that maybe the majority of people feel alone. So silence oh, and feel feeling so alone, alone when it happens. is those two things. And I think there must be a part of it that women speaking out about things that are hard, mm. difficult, painful, unpleasant for traditionally for yeah. people to hear about, including birth, the um, the messiness of it. And you know, the, the yeah. things that- It's messy. The things that, yeah, it's messy and like all the things around it. But yeah. that's like, that's like being a human. That's how people come into the world. And if you can't embrace it or lean into the unpleasant yeah. things. And I think until they're more in the, in the public 
consciousness, then they become not unpleasant, they become normal and, yeah, but it, and usual it is and, and, normal. and to be embraced. Yeah. Exactly. At the hospital, they kept referring to him as a miscarriage. Mm -mm -mm. And I just kept saying to them, I appreciate your medical terms for this, but he, he wasn't a miscarriage. Like I delivered a baby, like he was 20 centimeters, he's a baby. <gasps> the, the term miscarriage, that yeah. medical plan. Oh, no. And I just said to them, you know what, could you please, I got to know some of the people that I was seeing. I wasn't in the hospital for a long time, but I went back over obviously a period to check myself out and everything else. And I said, could you just please refer to him as my baby and not a miscarriage? And they were, they were fine about it. But obviously they're conditioned as doctors to, it's on paper, it's a miscarriage. And um, so I felt very embarrassed. And even when, I mean, I did that whole thing about announcing my bump on Instagram and people knew I'd had a struggle to get to the second baby point. And then I had to announce that I was no longer pregnant and I was getting emails and texts every day from friends and how's the bump? And I thought, okay, the quickest way to do this is to put a picture on Instagram and be like, explain a little bit about what happened. And you do feel very cautious and, and, and conscious of the fact that you're calling your baby your baby because so many people are quick to actually correct you, which is bizarre. Like, in what he, way? He was never in the world. Um, you know, you'd not met him. This is to, really to hard. I to... don't know what it is yet. I mean, maybe it's, it's to make the conversation easier for other people or if I'm calling my baby, unborn baby, but very alive baby in, inside of me, if I'm calling him my baby, you know, do people think this isn't the correct term for an un, a baby who hasn't been birthed, right? So I, I, I struggled with this for a long time. And now I just openly talk about my beautiful baby and oh my God, what a, you know, mother of three, beautiful baby. Um, but for a long time, I was so afraid and of saying my baby because of what other people might think, you know. And because of your film, I really think because of so much has been said about it, that hopefully many people will s stop and think to use a different terminology, to be more compassionate, to say, oh, I understand, you know, because I had friends who I've spoken to about it who really didn't understand. And certain things people said to me, people I didn't know so well, but had some form of relationship with were, were shocking, actually. Because it's not spoken about enough, which is what you've been so brave in your articles yeah. to do. And even sitting here with me talking about it, one in four pregnancies end in some kind of loss. That's 25%. Mm -hmm. And yet the amount it's spoken about <laughs> is not 25%. What I only hope for the film was that it would just, even a few people would think twice if yeah. they heard it happened to someone or someone maybe a few years ago it happened to and they hadn't known how to, that then they'd reach out and say, you know, and I think when people know something, yeah, they know there's more empathy. I'm a completely different person now on, on, on so many levels. My empathy is, is through the roof for other people, whether it's someone who's dying of cancer or has lost someone in another way or, or, or baby loss. But, and I don't want this to be taken in the wrong sense, but I, I'm very I'm very grateful, which is, it really can't be misunderstood. I'm very grateful to have the experience of giving birth to my son and being with him and, and having him die. No, I don't want him to, I didn't want him to die, but what it's given me since mm. is just this enormous sense of compassion and freedom and to know what's really important. And I didn't know what any of this was before. I thought I did, but I really didn't. The severe pain that it is and the endless days that I could only have imagined, you know, I tried to imagine. For that severe pain, I remember Ellen always saying to me in the middle of Ellen Bursting plays my mother in it, and she's so compassionate and beautiful and she's lived so much and she's experienced so much loss in her life and all yeah. sorts of different things. And she said, I was always so transformed by the most significant loss, losses mm. in my life. So yeah. in that sense, how lucky am I? You know, I wish he'd never died. I, of course I wish he'd never died. But then, you know, I try to say to everyone that reaches out to me and I get messages all the time and I'm so grateful for them. And I just say, you will be, you will be okay. And in some cases you won't be okay, but I don't, I, that's, you know, that's a limited percentage of people that really can't get past it. 
And I'm not saying it should happen quickly and, you know, take your time and just, but from someone who's three and a half years down the line of, of having that night where, you know, I, I gave birth to a baby and I watched him die. Like, you know, he was alive and, and I, you know, I, I watched him die. Like, it's just so unbelievable that this even happened to me. But so much can come from it. You know, the, the relationships I have with friends who were completely there for me, like we are untouchable now. We were great before, but now we are untouchable. The girls that just sat with me and offered their help and just checked in on me and, you know, not just that first conversation, like, are you, you know, are you okay? They, they kept coming back to see if I was okay. And that's what I needed. I didn't need like someone to offer their condolences and then not hear from them for six months. You know, it was that checking in on me thing that just solidified my love for these friends and family that just, they just made sure that I was okay. It is unimaginable and you will be suicidal and you won't want to live anymore and you won't be able to believe that you don't have a baby anymore. But you you will be you will be okay you know you'll be okay you just have to live it and you have to be around the right people that are going to help you live it rather than the people that say what still mm. <laughs> and all the other things that came that that were frankly quite shocking mm. that people said you know I feel I feel like I really live with with him you know he I live with him mm. and I always will live with him because one, I don't want to push him away, but two, I can't help but have him here because he's so part of me. And the more I speak about him, the more he stays with me. Mm. So what a, what a pleasure that is that, mm. you know, when I'm asked to, 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 to speak with people who've um, experienced it personally or in, in, a, in a different way as you have, you know, it's, it's just to me, you know, I jump at it. I'm like, I can talk about my baby again. This is amazing. Someone asked me recently, like, how does the film change you? And I realized by being asked that question that it's um, sort of living through a version of a grieving experience, which is nothing like what you went through. And I, oh, I, 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 as I said to you earlier, I feel so privileged that I got to try and imagine what mm -hmm. it was like for you just to be able to try and understand and that, that I am not absolutely not a spokesperson for it by any means, but I, I still want to, want to understand more about mm -hmm. it in a way. And, and and what that's done done for me is this this I've noticed myself like every day just be more sensitive, more compassionate towards right. anyone that's gone through something so hard. Yeah. And I know that the film I said this to you just now before we came here, like that the film is really hard. It's like not an easy watch. Some people are are kind of like, oh, it's 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 so tough. I'm not sure. But that experience is so tough. And, mm -hmm. and there are moments in life that, as you said, you, you go through something so unbelievably, searingly difficult that you didn't think it's your worst fear and you, and you found a way through it. Yeah. And you found a way from the absolute, you know, as you were saying, those suicidal nights, something, yeah. the, the pain being so overwhelming and, and you know, um, the women that shared with me, and I, I knew I had to understand the feeling of, exactly minute to minute how they felt mm -hmm. and and that's something that when you when you when you hear that and you listen to it and you and you feel with them yeah then 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 you you're more connected and of you course feel more you are like, and and you the connection is what now i understand was was the gift from all of this mm -hmm. is the connection that i've i've had with so many people that it's it's touched themselves um, personally, and but what I really wanted to know is when the when you were sent the script, did you was it an immediate yes or was it? Yeah, straight away. Really, like within as soon as I finished the last page. Yeah, as I was turning the page, I was like, oh, this hasn't really been explored on mm -hmm. on screen before, and it's Kata Weber, an incredible female writer who has lost a baby and felt the need to speak about it and was really frightened to do so, mm -hmm. and her. Husband Cornell directed it, and so they did it as a team, and it was very much like their need to share yeah. that that experience of that loss mm -hmm. and what that's like, and and to share it despite the the sense that it 
it might not want to be hurt. Mm. You know, and I think I imagine the aloneness comes from living with that feeling mm. and not feeling like there's a there's a an openness to 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 be able to share it and to and to and to have people sit down and say I I I, I hear you yeah. and I'm with you yeah. and I understand and I and I can't remotely experience what you are but I'm I'm holding space for your pain yeah that's and all you, that's all yes, we want all the women I spoke to and I know you told me this too have said people don't know what to say mm. even with Chrissy Teigen and Meghan Markle I was like someone's talking about their baby the way I spoke about it, mm. they, you know, she, her baby, Jack, you know, he mm. referenced him all the time. And I was like, this is what I was afraid to do when mm. it happened to me. And then I'm watching Chrissy go, this and the photos. And I was just like, oh my God. And I sobbed with her and I'm just, I'm just so grateful mm. that she did that. And then pieces comes out and I'm just like, okay, maybe we're getting somewhere with this, mm. you know, maybe we're getting mm. somewhere with this. Women being able to stand up and speak their experience mm -hmm. and feel like they might be heard, mm -hmm. even if there is, it's difficult, even if it's scary, even if we know that it connects with one other woman out there mm -hmm. who might be feeling so alone and like there's no one in her community that knows how to hold space for her pain and let, yeah. and let her go on that journey. Yeah. Walk beside her without having to change it, fix it, do anything mend it, feel like they, they need to like step away because it's too difficult. Yeah. So on that, on that note, what would you say is the best thing for anyone to ask, be there, you know, what, what to say to someone who might have experienced this, both the family, the partner, the woman? Don't just call once or send a card once, you know, it doesn't go away very quickly. You haven't, you know, you haven't just been ill. I felt I needed people to continuously check on me and I wanted to be loved and I wanted to be, you know, just held and sat with. It's another conversation we'll have another day, but there's many things you shouldn't say. Yeah. And a lot of people, honestly, a lot of people said to me when I, I emerged maybe from a, the deepest state of grief, oh, I'm glad you're better. I'm glad you're feeling better. And this is this is honestly one of the worst things to say to somebody who's grieving in any sense is because I was laughing and I was walking out in the park with them perhaps, or maybe we were in a bar, I've got no idea, I can't remember, but I'm so glad you're better. Mm. And I would just be like, oh, sugar, if you knew what mm. happens when I go home at night and what happens when I wake up in the morning mm. and what happens when I look at my belly and, mm. you know, if it's an early loss of pregnancy, ask about how they feel, you know, ask about the baby. I'm just thinking about anyone that might be in that place on day one or day four oh or month God. four. I don't want anyone you know, to be on that day one. Or 10 years on or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you having gone through that and and found a way to write about it, to share about it. I had to find a way that Axel didn't die for nothing. Yeah. You know, I had to find a way that he didn't, that, there, there will never be a reason and things don't happen for a reason when it involves death, in my opinion. But there had to be a way in my mind that he didn't die for nothing, you know, which is why talking to you, writing my book, writing the features for British Vogue, to receive the mails I get and the, the DMs and the emails and the comments and, you know, and I try as hard as I can to write back. There are hundreds of people and I welcome everyone who writes to me. I, you know, I want them to write to me and I want to tell them you will be like, you will be okay. You, you will be okay. You just have to really live this and surround yourselves with people that, that are going to help you with this and not, you know, I've, I've told you a few things about what I've heard, you know, through stories of, of people not being treated so well after baby loss. And you just have to remove yourself, if if possible, from those people. Judgment of other people going through different difficult things and how we judge them, that that that, that they the things that they need or they should be doing yeah. or shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Like you said, someone saying you're still grieving. You know, everyone's journey through grief is so different, yeah. and and maybe when we go through it, it's only when we come out the other side that we find it. We have more, like as you say now, you, you I bet you're so amazing at being there or holding space for people that have gone through any well, kind of pain. I, I hope you, I am because... Because you've been through it yeah. so much. Your empathy is so clear and it's so genuine. And, you know, I just think 
from looking at it from from my side, this film seems like it will be with you forever, you know, over possibly more others that you you know others that you've done. Yeah, and that's why when you know when you when you mentioned sort of the thing the first thing you asked me that I sort of went a bit read at or whatever about the nomination stuff like it it those things are so lovely but it's more I'm so I'm so I'm so grateful that it's for this that I love I so know, much I can tell and that there's something a bigger a bigger purpose outside yeah. trust me you're helping so many people you're really helping so many people and I'm just so happy this film is there and and that you haven't just taken this as oh a movie role you've got stuck in you know and now you better win the Oscar in the BAFTA. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Um, no pressure. But um, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us at British Vogue and talking to me and and just being so, so in it with us who have lost our babies. I'm honoured. So I'm honoured to be a, um, what would you call it? Honorary member? You're an honorary member of this god-awful club. <laughs> but you oh are. God. You're in it with us. No, I feel, I feel totally honored by that I really do yeah. I think that the oh my god the the courage the bravery the resilience the the love actually of the whole community mm. of women there's a lot of love right together. yeah the love they have yeah. as as mothers is mm -hmm. just like so colossal um so thank you so much for thank allowing you. me to be with you and yeah honorary member I like, <laughs> don't take that lightly thank you so much for including me